So we are looking at Coriolanus Act 2, Scene 2, and I think things will become a little bit more interesting here because we will be moving away from the world of fighting and Coriolanus will be thrust into a world that he is out of his depth in, a world in which he is very far removed from his comfort zone. So when the scene starts, we have... Um, taking place the action in the, the capital and the first officer says come come they are almost here how many stand for consul ships in other words how many are willing to be nominated you know there's no guarantee that the consul ship is yours although we do know what the, what more or less the criteria are to become a consul Three, they say, but as thought, everyone, Coriol Coriolanus will, will carry it, he, he will get it. That's a brave fellow, but he's vengeance proud and loves not the common people. And um, I think it just sums up so beautifully there, he's vengeance proud, meaning he's, he's horribly proud, he's, 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 his pride is just to the other extreme, and he doesn't love the common people, something that we know, something that... Coriolanus knows and something that the people know. Faith, there have been many great men that have flattered the people who never loved them and there be many that they have loved they know not wherefore so that if they love they know not why they hate upon no better ground. Therefore Coriolanus neither to care whether they love or hate him manifest the true knowledge he has in their disposition and out of his noble carelessness lets them plainly see it. And he says, um, this officer is saying that you don't have to love them. And they don't have to love you. It's a matter of getting the votes to get the position, you see. And Coriolanus is so indifferent in his, um, he's so indifferent to their public opinion. Because he knows that he can still get the votes, that's what the officer is saying. So then the first one says, if he did not care whether he had their love or no, he waved indifferent tricks, doing them neither good nor harm. But he seeks their hates with greater devotion than they can render it in, and leaves nothing undone that may fully discover him their opposite. Um, saying that Coriolan is, is so indifferent to the people and therefore, he doesn't need their love and he doesn't need their hate. But this guy thinks that Coriolanus seeks their hate. Or the people just like him more than they actually like him. And the people see Coriolanus as not on their side. And therein lies the problem. Now to seem to affect the malice and displeasure of the people is as bad as that which he dislikes to flatter them for their love. And he says, if you, if you flatter the people just to get what you want, that's a bad thing. But if the people will dislike you, that's also a bad thing. Then the second officer says, he has deservedly, he has deserved worthily of his country and his ascent is not by such easy degrees or steps as those who having been supple and courteous to the people bonneted without any further deed to have them at all into their estimation and, and report um, but he hath so planted his honours in their ear, eyes and his actions in their hearts that for their tongues to be silent and not to confess so much were a kind of ingrateful injury and he says that becoming a consul is not an easy thing. Getting the people's votes is not easy. And it requires that you that you go in humility. You really, really have got to bring yourself down low to the people. And um, that's the only way that you will win popularity. But he says when you look at Coriolanus, his deeds have given him so much honours in the people's eyes that um, if they are not quiet and if they speak up, it's going to make them seem very, very ungrateful. 
Okay. And then the first one says, uh, no more of him. He's a worthy man. Make way they are coming. And so, that's interesting. Let's not talk about him because he's worthy. Okay. But we know that's more how the pasts feel and less how the plebs feel. And so here we have the patricians and the tribunes and the lictors, which are just the magistrates attendants, and they're all coming in here, including Coriolanus. Now, please listen to this next bit of speech. And Menenius says, Having determined of the false keys and to send for Titus Lartius, it remains as the main point of this our after meeting to gratify his noble service that have thus stood for his country. Now that we have finished all the other administrative tasks, the only thing left is to thank this man, Coriolanus, for his contribution in, in defending our country. We need to show him our gratitude. And then he says, therefore, please you, most reverend and grave elders, to desire the present consul and the last general in our well-found successors to report a little of that worthy work performed by Caius Martius Coriolanus, whom we met here both to honour and to remember with honours like King Poppy. In other words, we want to acknowledge our debt to you by asking you to apply for the consulship. And I think when they ask you to apply, it's almost like guaranteeing that you will get the position. So the first senator says, speak, good communist, leave nothing out for length and make us think rather our state's defective for requital than we to stretch it out. In other words, give us reason to feel, reason to believe, um, confirm within us that our state, that the state of Rome is unable to ever repay Coriolanus. And that we know already to be, to be um, a fact. Masters of the people, we do request your kindest ears and after your loving motion toward the common body to yield what passes here. So we saying, he's saying, one, I want you to approve this motion that, Cor that Coriolanus applies and then secondly, I want you to use your influence on the people to agree to yield what passes here to agree to give their consent or their assent, okay? And the Sicinia says, we are convented, we have met upon a pleasing treaty and have hearts inclinable to honour and advance the theme of our assembly. So he's basically saying, yes, things have gone well and the way we are all here, we are definitely going to agree to what you have um, to say which the rather we shall be blessed to do if you remember a kind of value of the people than he hath year to prized at. That's off, that's off the point. I would you rather be silent, please to hear communists speak? Most willingly, but yet my caution was more pertinent than the rebuke gave it. He loves your people, but tie him not to be their bed fellow okay so what he's saying here is don't oblige him to have to speak because that's not the kind of person he is where the communist to speak and communist wants to actually leave and they say no no keep your place stay sit Coriolanus never shame to hear what you have nobly done and I think we can agree that Coriolanus is such a contrasting figure. He's a real enigma. There are things about him that are good and there are things about him that's really so messed up, you know. He doesn't want to hear himself praise. He doesn't want to um, have people talk about him. But then on the other hand, he's so insulting and he's so arrogant and he's so condescending. He's a real mixed up person. And Brutus says, Sir, I hope my words this benched you not. I hope my words didn't cause you to get up from the bench. Um, no, sir, yet oft when blows have made me say I fled from words. This is actually a nice quote, you know that. 
when blows have made physical blows when when being beaten you know while fighting caused me to stay um but i flee from words i don't like this teacher i don't like that at all you soothe not therefore hurt not but your people i love them as they weigh i love them according to the worth that you place on these people if you say they're worthy of love i will love them okay i had rather have one scratch my head in the sun when the alarm was struck than idly sit to hear my nothing's monsters so he says i don't want to hear how you guys are going to blow things out of proportion and make my deeds seem bigger than they are but the reality is that the deeds are big and then menenia says masters of the people your multiplying spawn how can he flatter that thousand to one good one when you now see he hath rather venture all his limbs for honor than one on ears to ears so so how can he get to the people how what does he need to say because he talks about your multiplying spawn there's so many of the plebs how will he which is actually insulting you know um because he'd rather risk his limbs arms and legs he'd rather risk his limbs for on on the battlefield but when it comes to people he is at a total loss and then communist says um i shall lack voice the deeds of coriolanus should not be uttered feebly it is that valor is the chiefest virtue and most dignifies the heaven and this is kind of summing up because i i don't really want to belabor this speech too much okay but part of what he's saying here is not actually shakespeare's words and these are lines that shakespeare has copied from a far older um philosopher called plutarch philosopher and writer so those are not his own um words here that bravery is the biggest virtue that's the most important quality to have if it be the man i cannot speak of the sorry if it be the man i speak of cannot in the world be singly counterpoised meaning that coriolanus there's nobody else who is equal to him at 16 years he was 16 years old when tarquin made a head for rome when the king raised his own private army he fought beyond the mark of others so he was 16 and he was already doing far more on the battlefield than other soldiers were even capable of doing our then dictator with whom all praise i point at saw him fight when with his um, amazonian chin he drove the bristle lips before him now amazonian the war the amazons the amazons were the female warriors and when he says that coriolanus back then when he was 16 was fighting with amazonian chin it means that like a woman he had no he had no facial hair he had no hair on his chin so it's just a roundabout way of saying he was a very young man he was 16 and he was fighting so well and he drove the bristle lips before him he was able to to conquer the much older man the men with bristles of the men with mustache the beards the much older men he bestrid an overpressed roman and the consul too he slew three apol he killed three men tarquin the king himself he met and struck him onto his knee he brought him down the 16 year old boy in that day's feats when he might act the woman in the scene he proved best man in the field and so what i'm saying some of this is not really so necessary it's just saying that um 
the historical deeds were often enacted on stage afterwards at, at, at intervals. And so you would have, um, a, you would even have the female roles played by young boys. Okay? And so even if you had had um, a woman portraying, which never happened, but if you had to have a woman portraying Coriolanus, uh, even then it would have been very clear that he was the best that day on the battlefield. Okay? Um, for his need, his reward was brow bound with the oak, the oak leaves. Um, his pupil age man entered thus. He waxed like the sea, and in the brunt of seventeen battles, since he has lurched all swords of the garland for this last before and in Coriolis. Let me say, I cannot speak him home. I can't find the words to do him justice. And he just carries on praising what a great fighter he was. And every single war or battle that Coriolanus partook in, he was amazing. Um, I want you to go down to line 9, 8, 7. Okay. He sword death stamp. You know, when you stamp, you leave your mark. Right. So death stamp is when you, when you, when the sword is a death stamp because when you, when you cut someone with it, they are going to have the stamp of death on them because they are going to bleed to death, they are going to die. He saw the death stamp where it did mark. It took from face to foot. Um, I mean, here's the part that I actually want to focus on. He was a thing of blood. He didn't, and, and the use of a thing is so beautiful because he didn't even look human. He was a thing covered, drenched in the blood of others, whose every motion was timed with dying cries. So every time he made a movement, actually swinging the sword, it was accompanied with dying cries. Somebody was crying as they were dying. Alone he entered the mortal gate of the city, which he painted with a shunless destiny. Um... In other words, he wasn't worried about the destiny. He was just boldly going in. Aidless came off and with a sudden reinforcement struck Coriolanus like a planet. Okay. Um, now all his when by and by the din of war again pierced his ready sense, then straight his double spirit requickened, blah, blah, blah. It just goes on. And all it is saying is that even though he was tired, he carried on fighting, he was twice as strong and um, he was always alert for the sound of the battle, he was always ready to fight. And then in 921, 121 Menenius says, worthy man, um, he cannot help but with measure fit the honours which we devise him. So it's not as if the honours are here and his accomplishments are here. They are actually on the same level. He he rises to the honours for him. Um, our spoils he kicked at. Remember he turned down his spoils and looked upon things precious as they were the common muck of the world. And that's another great quality that he didn't, he doesn't um, value or, or is not He's not materialistic. He's not materialistic, you know. It's, it's, it's really immaterial to him. He covets less than misery itself would give rewards. His deeds with doing them and is content to spend the time to end it. So this is someone who would spend his life doing great things. But where is the great things for him? Only on the battlefield. And so now... Coriolanus comes back in, he doth appear, the senate Coriolanus are well pleased to make the consul. I do owe them still my life and services, it then remains that you to speak to the people. So now, they've been so impressed by this, they've been so impressed by this 
very long speech. I think it was Menenius. Yes, oh, sorry, it was Communist. He's a uh, commanding chief that they've agreed that Coriolanus can get the consulship. But there's one step left. And that one step is to go to the people and to, I suppose it's more um, just like a, a ritual. It's a tradition, I suppose it is. Okay. And and now it's very interesting because Coriolana says, I do beseech you, I beg you, let me overleap that custom. Don't let me have to do that step. For I cannot put on the gown, stand naked. Now he doesn't mean without clothes. Naked mean I can't expose myself like that to them. I can't make myself vulnerable because that's not that's not who I am. And entreat them for my wound's sake to give me their vote. I can't go there, show them my scars, beg them for them. That's not who I am. Please you that I may pass this doing. And so straight from the beginning, the beginning, he's begging not to have to do this. Sir, the people must have their voices. They must have their votes. Neither will they bait one jot of ceremony. Um, and Menenius says, don't press them too hard. Just, just, just go. Just do it. Just do it. And Coriolanus says, it is a part that I shall blush in acting and might well be taken from the people. And I want you to take note that from here on, Coriolanus feels that he is playing a shameful role. Coriolanus feels that he is not true to himself. So he's getting the pressure on all sides from his mother, from these older senior men who, who really do love them, but they do love him, but they just, they just don't get him at all. To brag unto them, thus I did, and thus showing them the unaching scars which I should hide as if I had received them for the higher of their breath only. So he says, I mean, can you imagine me going up there and saying, look at the scar. Oh, you know where I got this and you know where I got this. He says, that's just not me. And Menenia says, do not stand upon it. Don't make it a big deal. We recommend you to you, tribunes of the people, and our proposal to them is that you must become our noble consul and we wish you all joy and honor. And the senator says to Coriolanus, come all joy and honor and... As they walk out, two men remain behind. And that is Brutus and Sosinius. And you know, these two, I suppose you could say, they hype each other up. And Brutus says, you see how he intends to use the people. Now, nowhere was the evidence that he plans to be horrible to the plebs. Because so far all Coriolanus has said is that he does not want to go out and do it. Not because he doesn't like him, but because he's out of his step. And the so says, may they perceive his intent. He will require them, he will ask of them, as if he did contemn that what he requested should be in them to give. In other words, he's going to talk to them as if they have to give it, as if they don't have a choice. Okay. And now we're going to see that they are going to manipulate the crowd, Sassanius and Brutus. Brutus and Sassanius. And, but anyway, that ends Act 2, Scene 2.